soothing story time. The Jesting of Arlington Stringham Arlington Stringham made a joke in the House of Commons. It was a very thin house and a very thin joke. Something about the Anglo-Saxon race having a great many angles. It is possible that it was unintentional, but a fellow member who did not wish it to be supposed that he was asleep because his eyes were shut, laughed. One or two of the papers noted a laugh in brackets and another which was notorious for the carelessness of its political news mentioned laughter. Things often begin that way. Arlington made a joke in the house last night said Eleanor Stringham to her mother. In all the years we've been married, neither of us has made jokes, and I don't like it now. I'm afraid it is the beginning of the rift in the lute. What lute? said her mother. It's a quotation, said Eleanor. To say that anything was a quotation was an excellent method in Eleanor's eyes for withdrawing it from discussion, just as you could always defend indifferent lamb late in the season by saying it's mutton. And of course, Arlington Stringham continue to tread the thorny path of conscious humour into which fate had beckoned him. The country is looking very green, but after all, that's what it's there for, he remarked to his wife two days later. That's very modern and I dare say very clever, but I'm afraid it's wasted on me, she observed coldly. If she had known how much effort it had cost him to make the remark, she might have greeted it in a kinder spirit. It is the tragedy of human endeavour that it works so often unseen and unguessed. Arlington said nothing, not from injured pride, but because he was thinking hard for something else to say. Eleanor mistook his silence for an assumption of tolerant superiority and her anger prompted her to a further jibe. You had better tell it to Lady Isabel. I've no doubt she would appreciate it. Lady Isabel was seen everywhere with a fawn-coloured collie at a time when everyone else kept nothing but a Pekingese and she had once eaten four green apples at an afternoon tea in the botanical gardens. So she was widely credited with a rather unpleasant wit. The censorous said she slept in a hammock and understood Yeats's poems, 
but her family denied both stories. The rift is widening to an abyss, said Eleanor to her mother that afternoon. I should not tell that to anyone, remarked her mother after long reflection. Naturally, I should not talk about it very much, said Eleanor. But why shouldn't I mention it to anyone? Because you can't have an abyss in a loot. There isn't room. Eleanor's outlook on life did not improve as the afternoon wore on. The page boy had brought from the library by mere and walled, instead of, by mere chance, the book which everyone denied having read. The unwelcome substitute appeared to be a collection of nature notes contributed by the author to the pages of some northern weekly, and when one had been prepared to plunge with disapproving mind into a regrettable chronicle of ill-spent lives. It was intensely irritating to read that dainty yellow hammers are now with us, and flaunt their jaundiced livery from every bush and hillock. Besides, the thing was so obviously untrue. Either there must be hardly any bushes or hillocks, in those parts of the country must be fearfully overstocked with yellow hammers. The thing scarcely seemed worth telling such a lie about, and the page boy stood there with his sleekly brushed and parted hair, and his air of chaste and callous indifference to the desires and passions of the world. Eleanor hated boys, and she would have liked to whip this one long and often. It was perhaps the yearning of a woman who had no children of her own. She turned at random to another paragraph. Lie quietly concealed in the fern and bramble, in the gap by the old rowan tree and you may see, almost every evening during early summer, a pair of lesser white throats creeping up and down the nettles and hedge growth that mark their nesting place. The insufferable monotony of the proposed recreation. Eleanor would not have watched the most brilliant performance at His Majesty's Theatre for a single evening under such uncomfortable circumstances, and to be asked to watch lesser white throats creeping up and down a nettle almost every evening during the height of the season struck her as an imputation on her intelligence that was positively offensive. Impatiently, she transferred her attention to the dinner menu, which the boy had thoughtfully bought, in as an alternative to the more solitary literary fare. Rabbit curry met her eye, and the lines of disapproval deepened on her already puckered brow. The cook was a great believer in the influence of environment, and nourished an obstinate conviction that if you brought rabbit and curry powder together in one dish, a rabbit curry would be the result. And the Clovis and the odious Bertie Van Tan were coming to dinner. Surely thought Eleanor, if Arlington knew how much she had had that day to try her, he would refrain from joke-making. At 
dinner that night, it was Eleanor herself who mentioned the name of a certain statesman who may be decently covered under the disguise of X. X, said Arlington Stringham, has the soul of a meringue. It was a useful remark to have on hand, because it applied equally well to four prominent statesmen of the day which quadrupled the opportunity for using it. Meringues haven't got souls, said Eleanor's mother. It's a mercy that they haven't, said Clovis. They would be always losing them, and people like my aunt would get up missions to meringues and they'd say it was wonderful how much one could teach them and how much more one could learn from them. What could you learn from a meringue? asked Eleanor's mother. My aunt has been known to learn humility from an ex-viceroy, said Clovis. I wish Cook would learn to make curry or have the sense to leave it alone, said Arlington, suddenly and savagely. Eleanor's face softened. It was like one of his old remarks in the days when there was no abyss between them. It was during the debate on the Foreign Office vote that Stringham made his great remark that the people of Crete unfortunately make more history than they can consume locally. It was not brilliant, but it came in the middle of a dull speech, and the house was quite pleased with it. Old gentlemen with bad memories says it reminded them of Disraeli. It was Eleanor's friend, Gertrude Upton, who drew her attention to Arlington's newest outbreak. Eleanor, in these days, avoided the morning papers. It's very modern, and I suppose very clever, she observed. Of course it's clever, said Gertrude. All Lady Isabel's sayings are clever, and luckily they bear repeating. Are you sure it's one of her sayings, said Eleanor? My dear, I've heard her say it a dozen of times. So that is where he gets his humour, said Eleanor slowly, and the hard lines deepened round her mouth. The death of Eleanor Stringham from an ozodoph of chloral occurring at the end of a rather eventful season, excited a certain amount of unobtrusive speculation. Clovis, who perhaps exaggerated the importance of curry in the home, hinted at domestic sorrow. And of course, Arlington never knew. It was the tragedy of his life that he should miss the fullest effect of his jesting. The end.